Hello everybody and welcome to what is probably the first of many little short videos, uh, hopefully five to ten minutes long, that I'll be making, working through some example problems and discussing some of the equations that we've got in the last little bits of content that we have left. Uh, hopefully everybody's at home feeling okay. A little smiley face there. Um, I myself am feeling a little under the weather, but don't worry, it's not uh, coronavirus, just a little stuffy head. Oops, let's erase that. Uh, which I looked up is not a typical symptom of the coronavirus, so I'm okay. Um, anyways, in the videos from Khan Academy and from Hewitt Druid, there was some reference to an equation called angular momentum, where uppercase L is equal to I times omega, which is analogous to linear momentum, which is inertia M times velocity V, but instead we've got rotational inertia and our rotational velocity in place. So kind of a direct analogy, all the equations pretty much work out the same, uh, which means that impulse also works. So in our linear systems, we have a force exerted for some time causes a change in momentum. That was the fat mav equation, you might recall. Fat mav. Well, their rotational equivalent works. You just swap out every linear quantity for rotational quantity and it still works. So for a system that has a constant uh, net torque applied to it, a sigma tau, for some amount of time, delta t, you'll get a change in angular momentum, which instead of m delta v will be i delta omega. So it's all pretty much the same old stuff. It's just uh, same ideas, just with different uh, labels attached to it. Impulses cause change in momentum. Linear impulses cause linear changes in momentum. Rotational impulses call, cause rotation, all changes in momentum. Um, let's go and take a, and I'll have to apologize, I'm doing this all on the fly, so uh, if I mumble a bit, it's just going to stay there. So for the units for that, we can see that the units work out. If we've got torque, that should be newtons times meters, and for time, that is seconds. And then on the angular momentum side of it, here, so that's the impulse. And then for the angular momentum, we've got rotational inertia I, which is kilograms meters squared. And for the angular velocity omega, that's going to be radians per second. Now, it doesn't look like those two things are necessarily the same, but when you remember that newtons is kilograms times meters per second squared, times meters times seconds, then we can see that one of those seconds cancels, the meters become squared, and you have kilograms meters squared over seconds. Remember, the uh, radians are a unitless number. So all that works out in terms of units. It's just we have to assume, uh, based upon what we know, that the linear equation is true, so the rotational equivalent is true as well. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at a couple of example problems here. I've got a child pushing a bowling ball along the top of the ball with a force of 10 newtons, and the force is going to last for 0.9 seconds. So there's kind of pushing on the top, of, and if I were to draw a line and the bowling ball here, I'm envisioning the force going like so. So they're trying to roll it along the surface. Uh, I've got the mass of the bowling ball 6 kilograms, and the radius is 0.15 and the ball starts from rest, I want to know what its angular velocity will be after the push. So uh, we're going to repeat the same scenario for example 2, for some reason isn't bolded, where once the ball is moving and it does gain some angular uh, velocity, so omega 0 will be equal to 0, and then we want to find out what its new omega is for example 1. Well that new omega in example 1 will become the starting omega for example 2. And now a bigger kid is going to push uh, for some time. And as I'm looking at it, it looks like that problem's not actually finished, so I might just have to uh, uh, finish writing it on the fly, but uh, somehow the text didn't pop through. So we want to, for example, one, figure out what the new omega is going to be. Well, that means if we're going to use the equation sigma tau times delta t 
is equal to i times uh, delta omega, we need to figure out what the new omega is, which means we have to know the i and we have to know the torque. So take a second, uh, you can pause the video here and decide if you can figure out what those quantities are. What's the torque going to be on this uh, bowling ball? And what is the, um, what's the I value going to be? It's a bowling ball, it's a solid sphere. So pause here and uh, I'll start working on the solution. So the torque acting on the object, the net torque should be the force. Oops, that's a, that's not a tau. Sigma tau is equal to force times radius times the sine of the angle theta. Here I'm going to assume that the kid is pushing tangents to the circle, so the angle is going to be 90 degrees, so that's just equal to 1 over 0, 1. So we would have 10 newtons multiplied by 0 0.15 meters. That will give us our net torque. times 10. So I get net torque of 1.5 newton meters. We have a solid sphere so the rotational inertia would be, let's see, it's 2 fifths mr squared, which uh, for us would be 2 fifths times 6 times 0.15 squared. So the I value would be 0 0.054. Sorry, just double check my numbers there. And so we've got our tau, we got our i, now we can solve for what the delta omega is. Uh, I can put in 1.5 times 0.9 seconds should equal 0 0.045, I'm sorry, 54. This dyslexia kicking in. And I'll get a change in omega. of 25. Now, that's a change in omega, and changes are always the new value minus the original. And since the original is equal to zero, because the ball starts at rest, that means the new omega value is 25 radians per second. All right, gonna pause here so I can work on the second example.